Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us as usual. Richard, thanks for taking the time out of your very busy schedule, I'm sure, um, because uh, Kashrut, I'm assuming, is an essential service and therefore um, does not stop and did not stop and has been going um, every day so far. Um, before we get into the current day to day, um, tell me a little bit of what got you into Kashrut in general, like your personal journey to heading a major Kashrut organization. Okay, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and hello to everybody out there. It looks like a really exciting program, so I hope everybody enjoys. Um, uh, behind me, I'll just say, is my virtual background. That is actually a kosher establishment in the city of Toronto uh, over 100 years ago. I think this picture was taken in 1915, and I just thought it would be a nice homage to, um, to what we're doing today. So, um, so, so, so we'll talk maybe for a second about me, um, uh, since you asked the question only. Uh, I have somewhat of an interesting journey in that I'm a lawyer and uh, started actually working in law and worked for about seven years in law in different capacities and was still trying to find my niche. Uh, and then I actually went back to business school and got a business degree and, and wanted to find something a little bit more, more fulfilling and got a job immediately coming out of business school and figured, no, this still isn't it. And then I got um, the job offered to come work at the COR uh, to, to act as eventually the managing director of, of the Kosher Council. Uh, and that's where I am today. And I've been there in, in this capacity for about 10 years and um, also picked up uh, Smicha Rabinic ordination along the way as well. So um, I, I, you know, I have a few degrees to my, uh, to my credit, um, but interestingly enough, and back to your question, in terms of managing, um, you know, a large kosher organization, all of these uh, degrees actually come into uh, to good use. Um, so of course, the rabbinic ordination, but even law and business uh, today, running a kosher organization is a, is a large undertaking, lots of employees, and um, dealing with large businesses. So all of these various aspects that uh, all these tools in the toolkit that I've collected over the years come to good use. So it's not like you uh, went into law school saying, I know there's a lot of legal aspects involved in Kashrut and that's my ultimate trajectory. I want to go into Kashrut, so I'm going into law. It's sort of, you, you realized you had a certain skill set and uh, you started at some point in Kashrut and then you realized that all the skills were leading towards one direction. Right. That's kind of, that, that's right. You know, I mean, I remember the first day of law school well, actually, when we had, you know, one of these round tables and people were supposed to go around and say, what, you know, what do you want to do? What, what, what kind of job do you want to have? I certainly was not thinking at that time, oh, yeah, I'm here because I, I, I want to be the managing director of a kosher organization. No, I did not say it at that time. I can't say that it did. Um, and also, you know, in my time as a lawyer, when I was kind of struggling, trying to find exactly what the right fit was for me. I had a, a good friend, a non-Jewish fellow actually, who I remember sharing a lot of my concerns with him. And he said, there gotta be some sort of organization in the Jewish community where you can use you know, your business and legal skills, but still be working in the Jewish community. And I was like, no, there's nothing. I, I, there, there's no, no. And then uh, all of a sudden this came around. So um, it's kind of funny the roads we take, but, one of the, uh, but eventually uh, they go to the right place. I believe one of the major chroniclers of the kosher industry in America is a lawyer, Timothy Litton. I don't know if you know him, but uh, I don't has, know him personally, but yeah, I know. He, he's like he's a lawyer. He's a law professor, and so he, he I guess he sees that, and that that became a big part of it. Um, so. Um, the previous things that we had been discussing in the past weeks, look, we looked at an AROV administrator, we've looked at um, book publishing, we've looked at, um, uh, what else have we looked at? Uh, circumcision, Brit Mila, we're going to be looking at Shita. All these things are very, very, very old uh, in terms of um, the way in which they work within the Jewish community. There have always been circumcised, there have always been Mohalim historically. Um, so it's not about questioning, but it's about discussing the credibility or the discussion around that. Um, but your background actually points out something very interesting because at the time of the milk store in 1915 in Kensington Market, there was no established kosher industry, right? Kosher, kosher is, is very, very old. It's, it's historically part of our, our heritage all the way back to the Bible, but to 
you know, kosher as an industry does not even go back less than 100 years. So I'm sure you have a nutshell, uh, in a nutshell history of like what happens and maybe specifically with uh, a focus on the COR. Um, where does that come from, this idea that we need an agency to take our, our milk stores and, and certify them? So that's a really good question. And I think that the general answer is that um, we never had in history, it's true, we didn't have kosher certifying organizations like we do today, although there were some um, nuances which we can discuss, but we didn't have the sophisticated food manufacturing processes that we had today also, right? So mm -hmm. the, the, the picture um, behind me is a good one in that that was kind of like the, the most sophisticated way that people had come to purchase food, right? And I think that it says on behind me, if I'm not mistaken, in, in that picture, it says something about fresh food daily. Mm -hmm. And so, so that is the point, right? Is that we would go to the market and we would buy, you know, whatever it was, butter or milk or, you know, maybe some bread. And so there would be some basic staples and, and that would be it. But you didn't, you, you, you never were able to go to the grocery store and buy um, prepared foods, you know, uh, hot dogs, cookies, um, the whole array of foods that we have today, you didn't have that. So with the dawn of more sophisticated food manufacturing, you had obviously the concern of, well, is this kosher or not, right? And I think that Heinz was uh, the good example that was one of the major companies that, that you know, signed on to kosher certification over 100 years ago, but they realized, hang on a second, we're doing, you know, pork and beans, and then we're doing our you know, regular vegetarian baked beans. Um, and people who kept kosher were saying, mm, you know, that's a problem for us because there could be cross-contamination, but also as we know, uh, we have different sets of dishes for, um, for milk and meat. And so therefore we have a concern when someone is making trafe, right? Somebody is making uh, pork and beans in the same equipment. So you, that necessitated having a sophisticated organization uh, and it's become more sophisticated over time, certainly in the 50s and 60s, it's not as sophisticated as it is now, but you had that need to be able to go into a company and audit. What's happening here? Are these ingredients actually kosher certified? When it says glycerin, for example, what does that mean? Is that an animal fat or is that vegetable? And you're not gonna know that unless a product has kosher certification. So that is, is in a nutshell, I think, the reason why it's become as prevalent as it has. However, all of these laws, I should mention, all go back thousands of years. So whether it's meat or cheese or, or milk or, or anything, all, all of these things go back uh, thousands of years. So we're not inventing any new uh, halachot, we're, we're just implementing them in a modern sensibility. So, um, the, so then we've gone from the historical, which is certifying, for example, we said the Heinz vegetarian baked beans and other products within certain factories, um, going into uh, manu so starting with manufactured goods, where we stand now, um, if, if I had to think about the verticals of where Kashrut is, so I think about, for example, uh, products, right, putting the COR on a package of cookies, um, restaurants and establishments, uh, takeout establishments, food establishments that require a mashkiach where food is being prepared and served directly to people. Um, but then there's also the industrial side of things. Uh, the example I always like to give that people have no idea exists is the um, tanker trucks, right? When you transport oil or various other ingredients in the tankers, they, those things have to be kosher and nobody thinks about those. What other verticals do you think, would you say that are the pillars of current kashrut certification and like where you know, the COR has their hands in, in terms of thinking. Well, you named, I think, a lot of the important ones. Uh, there's a few offshoots, um, which are, of course, wine production wine is production. its own, you know, niche and is quite sensitive because, you know, when you sit down um, on Friday night and, or you stand up rather, the way that we bring in Shabbat, right, is that we make the, the recitation over the wine uh, Kiddush, right? Kiddush. And so for, for, again, thousands of years of Jewish history, uh, wine has been a very sacred thing. And therefore, um, you know, the, the halacha prescribes that a Jewish person needs to be involved in every single aspect of that wine production. So that goes from the crushing um, the grapes and transferring to tanks and spigot testing. All of that 
um, needs to be done somebody of, of Jewish faith because of the, the holiness that we ascribe to wine. So wine is really a, a thing on its own, and, um, and, and there's, a, there's an intensive uh, certification and supervision that's, that's involved there. Similarly, I think cheese is, I would put it perhaps in its own category because, you know, there's kosher cheese and non-kosher cheese. Uh, typically, non-kosher cheese used rennet. Rennet was from the stomach lining of an animal, and so it had an issue uh, of being a non-kosher animal or, or killed, slaughtered in a non-kosher way. But then, of course, um, there's an additional potential issue of, of mixing milk and meat. So the the halakha always was for, for kosher cheese that it had to be a vegetable um, enzyme that, that started this uh, coagulant, that started this process, and that again, this process needed to have supervision um, from a person of Jewish faith, kind of from, from the beginning until the end. So that's an example of, of what we call hashkacha tamidi, which means permanent supervision. Um, and, and so that we have that, for example, whenever we have a cheese run that we do, um, there's somebody who is there, a mashkiach from our organization or from any other organization that's certifying who's there. So in a way, I would almost break up um, certification. Another way to look at kosher certification today is what, what's permanent and what is um, temporary supervision. Robin. Right, drop-in supervision, right? So what do you need permanent supervision? So for example, meat, shchita, it sounds like you uh, either have spoken to somebody or will. So shchita, or as I mentioned, wine, cheese, things like that. A fish usually will require permanent supervision. Or what can you do, um, a drop-in supervision, for example, Kellogg's um, or Kraft or any of these big companies, uh, you know, I hate to break it to anybody who might think otherwise, but there's not a rabbi sitting 24 seven at Kellogg's watching the cornflakes come off the line. Uh, you know, he, he goes in and he audits a few times a year. And of course, uh, there's a very robust system, but he, he does not have to be there 24 seven. So that's another way to look at it too, mm -hmm. I think. Okay, interesting. Um, so in your, uh, in your work at the COR, did you spend time in all of the different departments? Meaning, ha have you acted as a mashkiach as part of your training or as just to be able to be certified or trained? Have you gone into like factories or restaurants and said, you know what, if I'm the managing director, I need to, to know what it's like with my boots on the ground? Did you work your way up? Like, have you, have you done this? So I did do that. I, I wouldn't say that I worked my way up, right? Because I obviously came um, started at the from, top, huh? from, well, not necessarily, <laughs> but I did come from a different field with different experiences. Yeah, I talked about, you know, yeah, yeah. but, but I did, I, I actually, um, I did a Pesach hotel. Um, I said, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to act as a mashkiach. And I was there for nine days and it was a really interesting experience. You did it so your family can go eat for Pesach at the hotel. That, that too, that too. <laughs> I sacrificed myself. I was a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> And they appreciated it, I think. But um, but I'll tell you, you know, th that was a great education for me in so many ways. But it, you know, it was um, it, it was nine days where we are in this hotel, right? And it is the most highly kosher sensitive time. It, it, just in case we think of regular kosher being strict, well, how about on on Passover, right? Pesach, we know it's even stricter. And so we had to have, of course, a mashkiach in the kitchen at all times during production. So basically one mashkiach shift ended at two in the morning and another's started at four in the morning, right? Because the kitchen was only closed for two hours. So the only benefit that I got to perhaps being a more senior management was that I didn't have to take the 2 a.m. or the 4 a.m. shift. Okay. But outside of that, I was just like every other mashkiach and I'll tell you, I was in that kitchen the entire day for nine days. I only left the, um, the hotel premises once to go buy uh, my baby some diapers. That's how, uh, how hard I worked. So these mishkich work really hard. And I was in that kitchen um, all the time and the tremendous responsibility that it felt on my shoulders. Even when there was meal time, I couldn't relax because I needed to be in the kitchen making sure that everything is um, what was, you know, at the highest possible standard because you know, that, of course, we know that uh, other people are putting um, their faith in us. So we need to, to you know, earn that faith. Awesome. So walk me through um, 
let's say not Pesach, right? Let's say, let's put yourself in the shoes of an average mashkiach in a restaurant, uh, my favorite restaurant in Toronto, uh, Maron. I love it. It's a small French bistro. It's not too big. They're putting out some quality food. The mashkiach comes in. Uh, walk me through the day of a typical mashkiach like that. Sure. So a restaurant mashkiach has a, a number of things to juggle because obviously a food service environment is really fluid, right? You, you have more people who make reservations that day, so you need more food, um, or you, know, you run out of a certain ingredient and maybe you have to run out and get something. Uh, and then of course, you're making things fresh on a daily basis. So a mashkiach is going to typically have to come in and unlock the fridges uh, that is one of the, the halachot, the, the Jewish laws that go back um, many years in that somebody who is entrusted with the kosher program and is an observant person who's punctilious about the observance of, of the mitzvahs of keeping kosher, so he has to be entrusted with, with those responsibilities. So he will typically open up the, the kitchen um, and the, the fridges and freezers. Um, he will also likely, and I say he, but it could be a she, by the way, mm -hmm. too. We, we have uh, mashkichot, um, female uh, mashkichim who, who are equally capable, usually more. And uh, so, you know, I'm saying he just for the sake of brevity, but it could be he or she. And um, the mashkiach will then turn on the flames of the, uh, of the equipment. And the reason that he or she does that is because... Another halacha is called Bishel Yisrael, which means that a Jewish person needs to be um, somehow involved in the act of cooking uh, food, uh, most foods. So when he turns on that flame or she turns on that flame, um, he or she is responsible then and involved in the cooking process. So the mashkiach will turn on the flames and then the mashkiach will do um, inventory checks to make sure that any deliveries that come in are um, kosher certified, that they meet our standards, that they're on um, the list of accepted products. So, and, and actually our mashkiach will sign each delivery so that if, an, if another mashkiach comes, because we actually have a few different tiers of hashkacha, believe it or not. So another supervising mashkiach will come by um, every so often and he wants to make sure and look in, oh, I see every single ingredient here and inventory has been checked by the mashkiach. And then finally, a mashkiach, and in our case, it may be a separate mashkiach who comes, um, who specializes in this or not, but um, a mashkiach is responsible for cleaning the produce to ensure uh, that it's bug free. Okay, so insects, um, of course, you know, are unseemly to us, but they're also not kosher, and it's specified a number of times in the Torah that we may not eat insects. And so um, a mashkiach, or even an individual at home, needs to do a good job at washing um, his or her produce to ensure that it's insect free. Now, um, if you look closely, a lot of produce can be in, in, infested easily actually by insects. Now, this is not microscopic insects, right? We're, we're looking, if you look at a product, sorry, if you look at that piece of produce and you say, oh yeah, I can see something there. And then you look a little bit closer and closer and you say, oh, wait a second, that, you know, that has legs. So that's what we're looking at. So yes, some of these insects are small, but it's nothing microscopic. So the mashkiach needs to do a really, really thorough job of checking that produce to make sure that it's bug free. Um, and I would say those are the, the majority of the responsibilities the mashkiach has, but at the end of the day, his responsibility as well is to um, the proprietor that he works with and to the, the customers who come into the restaurant. And so sometimes he is used as a resource Sometimes he's, he's asked for his assistance, advice, anything like that. So Mashkiach is really kind of a, a jack of all trades in some ways as well. So the representative of the, of the organization in the restaurant and basically saying, I'm the agent that says, you know, you want to know why this is kosher. This is, I'm here. And, and people, Mashkiach often will, can get called in from the kitchen to answer a patron's question about the kosher of, an, of, of the institution or whatnot. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, that's true. And, uh, and depending on the facility that they're in, that could be more of their job responsibility. So for example, we certify some supermarkets. And so in the supermarket, um, that's one of the main jobs that the, the rabbi, the mashkiach has. They'll say, you know, rabbi, aisle three, you know, and so the rabbi has got to go and mashkiach has to answer some questions 
um, you certify uh, you know, a number of supermarkets where that's a main component of the Mashkiach's job. Excellent. Um, so uh, then what happens when something goes wrong? I remember when I was uh, studying for Smicha myself, uh, my rabbi always used to tell us that if you have a Mashkiach under you that's not asking questions, right, then there's a problem there because things are going wrong and they're usually trying to solve it on their own. Right. So what's the process that happens? You have a mashkiach. There's a question that happens in the kitchen. He doesn't he or she doesn't know how to answer it. Um, what how does it go up the chain? Right. So you're right on there that the mashkiach obviously is well trained and we have you know, empowered him to make some important decisions. But at the same time, uh, there is an important um, chain of command, so to speak, and also um, there are some we'll, we'll call it checks and balances. Um, you know, we're, we're in political season almost, so we'll call it checks and balances the way we have it. So, so there are uh, mashkichim who work at various establishments. Then we have a senior mashkiach who will come and audit those establishments on a regular basis. And so he will, will pop by. And so the mashkiach himself knows, oh, I can ask my senior mashkiach if something goes wrong, you know, they have WhatsApp and, um, and so they're able to get a hold of one another very quickly. And then um, in, in a food service restaurant setting, there is the, the head of the department, Rabbi Tzvi Haber, who will you know, field most of those questions. If for some reason there is a, you know, a very significant issue um, that perhaps he needs some help with, he may ask um, a, one of the senior post game um, halachic decisors to, to you know, opine and, and give uh, his, his view on it. That, I would say that situation is quite rare, but it does happen. So there is an ability to, um, like I said, Meshkiach should be empowered to be able to make decisions on the ground, but at the same time, he knows that he needs to work his way up, especially if there's an issue and we have a way to, uh, you know, to resolve those issues. So, uh, yeah, so, so as long as a restaurant is open in Toronto, um, that rabbi is on call. It often will not happen, but, you know, he knows that if he has a list of mashkirim that will call him, he picks it up right away and the answer will be forthcoming. That's um, right. Excellent. So suppose somebody in our audience today says, wow, this is so fascinating. Uh, I'm applying to the COR. I would love to become a mashkir. What, 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 what does that entail? So it, it um, entails a few things. First of all, we have a, a course, actually, um, a mashkir training course. Uh, that is affiliated with a, a local college. So it's actually a kind of a college accredited course. It takes a, a few months and um, it spans a, a fair amount of information. And there are exams, just like any, you know, college course or other training I, designation I think you I, might have. I think I placed out of it because I served as a mashkiach in Chicago, and I think it was just having a conversation. But I think I oh, have really? that, so well, it's different. You know, we, we wanted to professionalize it a little bit more. I think, I, that, I think it's wonderful. I, I, I believe in professionalizing it much more. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, you know, you get a diploma, a certificate, and, and we felt like that was important for the mashkiach, uh, but also for the establishments that he works with, that, he, that they should know, hang on a second, this is someone who, who went through training and has a designation. So um, there's also some on-the-job training as well, of course. Um, and then you yourself have to be somebody who, of course, is familiar with the laws, who keeps kosher. You know, you, this is not a theoretical thing where, you know, perhaps you're I don't know, maybe a health inspector and uh, you can have your, your home be in disarray, but you go out and you have to uh, enforce the, the regulations uh, as a health inspector. It's, it's not like that. We feel like this is a spiritual obligation and responsibility and a mission. So you yourself have to have signed on to that mission and be somebody who is um, who's engaged in that. I've had, uh, I've had my share of uh, having to tell students when I was doing Kashkachas or Hilla houses that, you know, one of the things about doing kosher is you have to live it. Like, and it's part of the ability of having that trust is that you're, you, you sort of feel it internally. But yeah, sometimes there are difficult discussions around those things. Have, have, has that happened where you've had people who've applied and you've sort of had to say, listen, it, it probably isn't for you? I mean, there could be a whole host of reasons where why being a mishkiach is not for somebody. It's true, um, true. So yeah, we, sure. we, yeah, we've we've had those discussions, but again, like I said, it could be a, a number of things. If you're not a detail-oriented person, for example, probably not the job for you, right? Um, because you need to be taking care of details. 
if you're somebody who's not that responsible, you know, or, or you're constantly late, that might also be a little bit of a red flag because if you need to be there, you know, at 8 a.m. to open up the fridges and, and turn on the flames, but, you know, you saunter in at 11 o'clock, um, well, there were a bunch of employees who were, you know, sitting around twiddling their thumbs, right? So, um, so there are a number of reasons and yeah, we, we've had uh, those conversations and, and, you know, sometimes we've had to let go much Kishim, um, unfortunately, but I think for, you know, for, but, but for the most part, um, people who realize that this is something that they want to do, um, do quite well at it. Uh, okay. So I want to switch a little bit to your job at the, you know, the upper tiers. What, what is, um, what can you tell me a little bit about the upper echelons, the, the C-suite, so to speak, of Kashrut? Um, what is it, what does it involve? I assume that it's not always purely reactive. You're just sitting there waiting for questions to come from your mashkirim, waiting for people to apply for kosher certification. Um, I'm assuming that there's a lot of work that goes into kashrut at the high level that we're not aware of. Uh, maybe fill out some of your personal day or a typical day. I, I'm, although I'm assuming there are no typical days for you. You're right. There are no typical days. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I like my job so much uh, is that before, you know, as a lawyer, I felt like a typical, I knew exactly what one day was going to be. And it was so r restricted. Um, and, you know, Dare I say it, and I hope I'm not offending any lawyers who might be out there, but it was very boring. I, I personally found it very boring. So nobody take offense. But um, there are lawyers on this call right now. Oh, oh, okay, okay, fine. I'm gonna sign a <laughs> liability disclosure. So, um, but but every day is different. But having that said, I think one of the important things um, about the the organization, um, the kosher organization, is that it needs to be a functioning professional organization, right? So uh, like I said, you know, maybe 50, 60 some odd years ago, and we, we started um, discussing at that at the, at the beginning, things were different, but today, you know, this kosher is of course a spiritual pursuit, first and foremost, but we need to run these like professional organizations because if we don't, then we're not gonna be able to deliver um, what we need to deliver. So what does that mean? That means that uh, you have to have, or we at least, we implement uh, management meetings. So that means that we have, you know, heads of department who come to meetings on a weekly basis, um, of course, with myself, and, you know, we're all able to bring issues to the fore and discuss them with our colleagues if we feel like we, you know, need to have a little bit of discussion. But at the same time, there's an accountability too, and I think that's important. Um, there is, of course, uh, you know, just the, the general details of running an office, right? So you have a host of employees, you need to make sure that everyone is happy, that everyone's concerns are heard. Um, and certainly in times like these, in, uh, in the days of coronavirus, um, you need to be able to adapt. So, so that is what we're doing. Our office, as you mentioned, we are an essential service, so the office is technically open, but we um, are saying that uh, only people who feel like they must go into the office should go in because we don't want to put anybody uh, at risk unnecessarily if they don't have to be. So, so that creates a whole host of other challenges um, in terms of how do you deal with employees who are working remotely and how do you make sure that the office, e office ethos is still running smoothly. And then you have um, emergencies that come up and they do, uh, unfortunately, maybe it could be a, a legal issue, it could be um, an operational issue, it could be something in the community, it could be a media related uh, inquiry. Uh, I do myself handle all of the, the media inquiries at, at, the, at the COR. So um, that's another area that we need to um, be responsible for because the truth is that it's a certain sense of transparency. People wanna see you know, what's happening um, behind closed doors, how does this organization work? And, um, and then I would say as well, and just finish it off, of course, we need to have, um, you know, robust and positive communications with our proprietors, the people um, that we certify. So if that means in the food service and, you know, um, our restaurants and caterers, um, but it also means, of course, the companies that we certify, and we certify a a total of around a thousand companies, uh, both in Canada and around the world. So, you know, that means that we need to uh, be responsive to companies like Kellogg's and Kraft and Pepsi, and then even smaller companies as well. So if that's, 
you know, if that means talking to them on the phone or going in meeting and, and just um, and discussing issues. I like to say whenever a company contacts me, you know, when you put smart people in the room, you usually come up with a good solution. And so oftentimes there are problems that a company has. Uh, let's say they want to start operating uh, non-kosher. How do you manage that? Maybe they want to do on a dairy line. They want to do non-dairy, whatever it is. But as long as you sit down with the company in the spirit of cooperation, you can usually come up with a solution. And that's uh, a big part of what we do. Uh, you mentioned coronavirus. Um, what are some of the things that you've had to adapt, let's say in the early days right away when everything was like basically shut down and now are there any long-term ramifications for how you've started to shift things around in terms of... Uh, uh, yeah, offices? so I think we're still, yeah, we're, we're still seeing how things will shake out in the long term and certainly this has been a difficult time, I think particularly through the food service establishments. We're fortunate in that we're in an industry that people still need, right? We all still need to eat. Um, at least I'm doing a very good job of that during coronavirus. So we, um, we're we still in an industry that's needed. Um, and so the companies are still in need of certification. Um, but the food service, I would say, is suffering a little bit harder because people aren't going out to eat as much. Um, so a lot of the restaurants, I think, it seems have adapted pretty well to take out. Uh, they've been active on social media in terms of encouraging people to do take out nights and take out days and, and things like that. I would say maybe the caterers have suffered a little bit more, even though some of them are being creative as well. Because, But, but if you think about it, you know, um, this is prime wedding season right now of, you know, hundreds of people coming to events on a nightly basis. Um, that was last year, right? Think about this year, not so much, right? So, so some of those, um, uh, you know, establishments are, are, are definitely suffering. Um, I, I'm hoping, and I think they're hoping that this is somewhat temporary. Um, the government has, of course, had some good programs in place to, to tide them over. So um, I don't think we've had any major closures of restaurants or caterers, but I know that it's difficult for them. So that's from, from their side. And from our side, yeah, like I said, a lot of people are, are at least from the office perspective, are working from home. Um, you know, the people who mashkichim were working in restaurants, that's not something that they can do from home. So they're still going in and of course taking all the necessary precautions. And then the rabbis who go visit those factories, um, some inspections are taking place online, uh, similar to what we're doing now. And then I've heard a lot of great stories about the rabbis who know those plants so well, and they're being taken through on an inspection. And the rabbi says, hang on a second, you have a new supplier for molasses I see in the background? I say, oh, rabbi, how did you notice that? So, so, so that's a good use of, of technology. But at the same time, that can't be uh, the only way that we do kosher supervision. And so we're trying our best, um, again, taking all the necessary health precautions to go into the facilities themselves auditing them and doing that. And of course, like everybody out there, we're hoping that this will end soon so we can get back to semi-normal. Uh, okay, so I want to, um, before we go further into the future, um, I want to just take a, a moment or two to address a lot of the uh, questions. Um, you just drank some water there. Somebody asked, um, uh, can you tell us about uh, the discussion around New York City drinking water and that there there might be some issues around there, uh, the kosher around that, what's your opinion on those things? and uh, Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, uh, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just make some some general comments about it because um, I'm not located in New York, and I'll I'll leave it to the local people. But again, let's go back to what I said previously about insects. So, insects are not kosher. Fine. Microscopic insects that you cannot see um, with that you could not see with the naked eye, you don't have to be concerned about. It, right. So the question is just what happens when you have an insect, which you actually, even though it's small, you could see with your naked eye. So there has been some discussion about, um, you know, a, a lot of different products. We can take it away from water for a second, but, um, you know, there have been discoveries, for example, about, um, uh, you know, new fruits or vegetables that people thought up until now, oh, this was fine. But um, then they realize and look at it on closer inspection and realize it was an issue. So for example, raspberries and blackberries, I hope I don't ruin anybody's appetite or um, dis dissuade you um, from eating something that you love, but raspberries and blackberries, you know, I grew up as a kid, I had them all the time, right? But um, some more in 
inspection was done and it was seen that these are, are these are, are fruits and vegetables where insects can really um, infest. They go into those florets very well um, and they hide in there. So if I had a company who wanted to get their frozen um, blackberries and raspberries certified and they said, you know, they really were insistent. And I told them this spiel that I'm giving you. And they said, no, 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 ours are fine. They're, they're IQF, they're, it's high quality, they're frozen, not an issue. I said, you know what, well, let's send it to a lab. We'll send it to an independent lab and we'll see what happens. And, you know, maybe if you're right, you're right. So we sent it to a lab. It was a five, uh, it, was a, it was less than a half pound sample. I'm dealing with the Canadian metrics. So 500 grams. So I don't know exactly what that is, a but it's not over a lot. pound. Okay. 500 grams is yeah 454 oh, oh, okay, grams. Fine. So um, they found in the 500 gram sample there were 34 insects um, there, and those were ones that were visible to the to the naked eye. So again, could be that it's more significant than one is aware. So now there have been some reports. Sorry for that long preamble, but there have been some reports in uh, that that New York City may have some insects in their water supply. So there are differing opinions. Uh, some feel that they're microscopic. Other feel that they're not. Some feel that they're mixed into, um, and, that, and therefore there are other leniencies available so you don't need to filter the water. But there are some who feel that it's important to, to filter the water. In, in, in Canada, I haven't heard any um, you know, requests or demands to, to have water filtered, but, uh, but I know that there are some in New York uh, who have this opinion. Excellent. Um, staying on drinking, if there's a secret ingredient in Coke, how do we know that it's actually kosher? Great question. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, if you Google this, you'll see that there are some um, articles that say like the only people, there's only two people that know the actual formula in the world to Coke. It's, you know, the CEO and Rabbi so-and-so from Atlanta. So um, apparently he went in and he audited um, the, the actual formula and he said it was fine. But when we uh, go in and we audit a facility, sometimes there are other companies that are also pretty um, secretive about their ingredients as well. Now, so we tell them, number one, we're not looking at your formula, right? Formula will mean how much, what the percentage of this to that is. We're looking at the ingredients. So if, you know, you just dump a whole bunch of sugar um, and some caramel color in there. So if you don't know the ratios, then it's not going to do you much good. So uh, that, that, that I think is, is another answer as well. Is that the, Of course, we know the ingredients that go in. We just don't know the proportions that they're in. And the, frankly, the proportions don't matter for kosher purposes. Excellent. Um, can you get, sort of give us, um, and this answers a few different questions, a, uh, a little bit of insight into the larger kosher ecosystem in terms of the relationship you have with various kosher manufacturers, um, how you decide whether, you know, if they certify it, let's say, I don't know, Kosher Check out of the Western Canada, right? They're a wonderful kosher organization. If they certify something, it's probably acceptable by you. How do you, how did these discussions come about in terms of what's reliable, what's not reliable, the overall, um, you know, scene of what's kosher and what's not, uh, and maybe just spend a little bit of time on the um, kosher agencies that are the uh, super agencies, the ones that do Hasidic kosher, that are ultra orthodox, that are saying, well, the OU is certifying something or the COR is certifying something, but we want to go in and send in our own mashkiach uh, on top of that. And what's the nature of all of, you know, that, that whole, you know, that world. Okay, great. So those are two really separate questions, I think, but I'll try to deal with them. Um, so the first one is how did the kosher organizations work together with one another and how do we rely on one another? And the truth is that it, it's, it's pretty strong, the relationship um, between the different kosher certifiers. We have an umbrella body that's called ACO, the Association of Kosher Organizations, and we are, are very um, frequently in contact with one another. We have annual meetings in person pardon me, we have annual meetings in person, and um, we have a, a chat, actually, a WhatsApp chat, which is ringing on a daily basis um, with messages back, back and forth, questions and what have you. So um, one of the things that ACO also does, it sets minimum standards for what a, a kosher certifier is required to do. And so on that basis, um, for the most part, the accepted kosher organizations will abide by those minimum standards and there's a sense of reciprocity amongst kosher certifiers on that basis. Um, now the the bad news is is that you know 
not all kosher certifiers are created equal. Um, and some have different mandates or different standards, or some have, uh, you know, potentially people who are uh, not experts in the field, or um, even worse, there are some that are, are either run by, um, I would say fraudulent, but there are a few out there that are fraudulent, the people who have died. Um, so, uh, so there is an important element of a kosher program is knowing, okay, the ingredients that are coming in, who's standing behind them, who's certifying them. So of course, if we have a, a, an OU or an OK or a Star K or anything like that, so we know, we know them well and we work together with them really well. And so we, we rely on them, of course, without question. Um, the question then becomes, oh, hang on a second, I've never heard of, you know, the chief rabbi of Namibia, um, you know, so I need to, does anybody know the chief rabbi of Namibia? And, um, you know, so I'm just choosing that as a hypothetical, of course, uh, no offense to the but chief rabbi is, of Namibia. There probably is no chief rabbi of Namibia, so. Yeah, there I, might I be certainly other. hope so, because if there is, I've offended him, and he's <laughs> many times. hate mail. He is yeah. your example that you use at every interview. <laughs> yeah, I should really, chief rabbi of Madagascar, maybe, is that better? I don't know. So um, a anyway, we, we do have a responsibility to, to look into things, and sometimes they, they don't measure up to our standards. But but for the most part, there's a, a really good uh, back and forth between the kosher certifiers. Uh, we are in touch with them on a daily basis and have a, have a good working relationship um, with all of them. So, so I think uh, that answers question number one. The question question yep. number two is, well, more or less, okay. Question number two is uh, the Hasidic certifiers. And this is um, a little bit of a, of a more in-depth subject, but, you know, so there are a few categories of things that um, that a cer certain groups want to have more robust and intensive supervision, and also they have a stricter interpretation of certain um, halachas. So, for example, I would say these are, there's going to be a couple of major distinctions. One is when I told you about Kellogg's and Kraft and how there's not a rabbi sitting there 24-7 at, at Kellogg. So what, a Hasidic certifier might say, you know, we want to have permanent supervision at all of our plants. They, they may say that, right? They may say at all of the finished products, we want to have hashgacha tamidi, right? Full-time supervision. And so that's a, a philosophical decisions that they made, uh, that they want to have somebody who's there permanently. And that, of course, uh, it might add a little bit to the cost of the product, um, but it also makes it um, more marketable to certain um, segments like the, the Hasidic uh, um, world. But then there are some also s some other additional stringencies. So for example, um, this is uh, somewhat more uh, detailed, but we as the mainstream kosher certifiers will rely on um, let's say milk that has been milked in a federally regulated facility and we go in to check periodically because we we say that the federal regulatory system is robust and and ensures that they're not substituting any non-kosher milk pig or camel or anything like that because they would lose their license but um, a Hasidic organization would say no we only want to have milk that is supervised by a Jewish person throughout. Okay, so that means then, if you follow that to its logical conclusion, any dairy products, right, milk chocolate will have to have milk from what is called Chalav Yisrael, right, um, that is in permanently watched by, um, by a mashkiach. So um, that is an example of, there's probably a handful of stringencies where, um, uh, in the business, we, we, call, we call it a Hamish Hashgacha, right? So um, a few stringencies, let's say there are five or six stringencies which a Hamish Hashgacha will employ, which would make it different from a COR or an OU or a Star K. And then of course, the philosophical difference too, that we wanna have permanent supervision during the making of that final product. So it's, it's a question of different philosophy. Um, I don't, they're not saying that COR, the OU is, is unacceptable. They're saying we have a different standard. Standard. Um, 
so uh, there's a question here uh, that I want to open up a little wider in uh, that somebody asked, are vaccinations kosher? And I think that the, the larger question is, are there limits on what the COR says you need to certify? And if you come to us with saying, listen, we want to get our, uh, our whiteboards certified that they are kosher and we think people will buy more of them, um, will you give us an imprimatur that the whiteboards or our furniture is kosher or our water is kosher? Um, Will you, do you certify certain things and you, or do you say certain things don't need certification even if you ask us whatever it is? And do vaccinations need hashkacha? Yeah, so vaccinations <laughs> don't because you're not, you're not eating it, right? You're, it's being injected yes. into you. Um, so that's an easy one. Um, so basically, and then to your broader question, you need to balance two things, right? On the one hand, um, you know, there's a story of one of the rabbis in our office who we certified a, a facility that made dish soap. Okay, so dish soap can have um, what's called surfactant is what makes it mm -hmm. uh, slippery, right? And so it could have an animal fat in it. So, um, you know, most, most of them don't, but we certify this facility that makes dish soap to say that this uh, dish soap does not have any animal fats in it. But they also make other soap products there, right? So um, they put it on their laundry detergent. So the rabbi went in and said to the, you know, the owner of the facility, uh, hang on a second. You don't need to put the kosher certification on the laundry detergent. You're not eating it, right? So he said, Rabbi, you do your job and let me do my job, okay? You're talking from a kosher perspective. Very nice. But I am talking from a marketing perspective. And when the, the detergent that's kosher and the detergent that's not kosher are sitting side by side, a lot of people prefer the kosher detergent. So you let me do my business. So in that situation, we kind of had to be flexible. For the most part, our rule is that it has to be something that somehow comes into contact with food. So that's why dish soap, or food of course, or comes into contact with food. So dish soap, for example, is something that we do certify. However, on the other hand, I remember receiving a phone call from a Chinese company that made furniture. And he said um, to me that he's looking for kosher certification. So I said, for your furniture? And he said, yeah. I said, are people eating your furniture? No, 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 no. So why are you looking for kosher certification? Well, people say when it's kosher, it's high quality and my furniture, high quality. I was like, um, no, sorry, we're not gonna do that. So there is a, an element where we, we draw the line and, um, and that's where we draw it. So I wanna start uh, closing the loop a little bit. Um, you, uh, when we were talking about your, uh, your background there with the, uh, the, and the rise of kashrut and saying that kosher used to be fairly simple and straightforward um, because food products were relatively simple and straightforward. Um, I was thinking about an analogy, uh, Nathan Merkold, who used to be the chief technology officer at Microsoft and he left to form this company called Kitchen Innovations. They published this seven volume book called Modernist Modernist cooking, um, which was the the guide towards the uh, the future of cooking and and how not only sous vide but using rotary evaporators and dehydrators and um, really perfecting the art of kitchen. So he talks in his first volume, which is basically the introduction to the whole book, is just one volume, no recipes, just talking about it. He has a whole history of food and he says that the interesting thing about how uh, up until about 100 years ago, if you walked into a science lab and you walked into a kitchen, you had fairly close, uh, very similar um, tools being used, right, in terms of heating and cooking and making science and, and cooking were fairly hand in hand. Both were relatively primitive, but they were advanced for their times or whatever it was. And they, they, but at some point, um, science took a massive leap forward in terms of their ability to do certain things and food sort of stayed where it was, right? We're starting to see that shift. And so the question I guess that I have to you is where do you see the future of kosher certification with regards to how technology is affecting the way that um, food is both being produced and being consumed um, and also just thinking about the nature of the way in which it's easier. I know, for example, some kosher certificate certifying organizations have taken to using um, cameras in kitchens as, um, you know, equivalent to having a mashkiach in the, in the kitchen all the time. Some people have not. Um, where, where are things moving towards in terms of kashrut, uh, both, like I said, at the certified side, but also in terms of food production and thinking about the, all of that stuff. Rabbi Avi, you asked the good questions. They, I hope they pay you. That's why they, 
<laughs> they pay you the big bucks. Okay, that, so, so a few uh, observations come to mind. Um, I think that food production is getting more sophisticated. And so it will continue to the factories, I think will get um, somewhat larger and more sophisticated. I, I went into a, a factory that makes bread um, recently. And I said to the, the, the plant manager, I said, where are all your employees? Um, and he said, no, we don't have any robots, right? And so there were robots, everything. He said, these robots are fantastic. They don't complain. They don't go on strike. They don't ask for overtime pay. Um, you know, they don't get sick. So I think that that will be a trend that the facilities themselves will get larger. Uh, and that's also being demanded by a lot of regulatory regimes that, you know, kind of sophisticated food safety programs are required. And it's crowding out smaller um, players because, you know, you can't compete with the, the factory that pumps out, you know, tons and tons of, of bread make, baked by robots if you're a small mom and pop. And also if the government is requiring uh, some sophisticated food safety programs in place, and if you're a small place, you're not gonna be able to do it. So I would say that's my first observation is that there's gonna be larger facilities and um, it'll crowd at smallers. Um, I think the next, in terms of supervision, I think that this uh, coronavirus has been an interesting experiment for all of us, the entire world on so many levels. And we've been able to see there are certain things that we can live without. There are certain things that are actually better the way it is. Um, certainly my kids think so. They want to stay like this. They don't want to go back to school. So there are certain advantages. And I think from the kosher perspective too, we um, will take some learning from this. And, and while at the end of the day, we know we need to be in the facilities, and that's the way that we feel that, that kosher supervision is the most effective. Um, at the same time, I think there will be a little bit more um, uptick and willingness to use some video um, means as a supplement, right? So if, if let's say you typically do uh, 12 inspections a year, um, but it's very difficult to get to this factory, okay, so maybe you know, you're gonna do eight inspections plus four, or maybe even six um, video inspections. Maybe this adds, for the ability for you to do more in video inspections because it's easier. Um, and then my final observation, I think that from a food service perspective, it's possible that there'll be some sharing of resources also. We're still gonna wanna have um, you know, the ability to, to go to a restaurant or of course have simchas, but there also I think is an understanding, especially in the age of Uber, that restaurants are starting to understand, hang on a second, if 40, 50, percent of my business is Uber, why do I need that expensive storefront um, when I can go to, you know, a cheap place in industrial location and my rent is cheaper and then so that means that the, the food may be less expensive. We uh, in Toronto certify actually uh, a kosher, sorry, a shared kitchen facility called Kitchen 24. It's 30,000 square feet and it has two kosher kitchens within it. And that's one of the things that it does. It gives you the ability to go in on an hourly basis, make your food. Uh, it's called Ghost Kitchens. It's a popular uh, thing that's developing now. And I think that it is something that potentially um, the food service establishments may see after this saying, hmm, so many people are, um, are ordering food and maybe even consumers themselves may say, yeah, you know what, I'm just gonna order food. And so therefore they may say, either we can share resources or maybe go to some of these ghost kitchens, maybe the expensive, uh, storefront is not necessary. Excellent. All right. So that's really interesting. Um, what are some of the, uh, just to, to end on a bit of a lighter note, uh, what are some of the wilder stories you've had? I mean, we talked about kosher furniture. Um, have there been moments where you were just like, you know, smack your head and say, what's, I, I did not sign up for, for these types of uh, episodes to happen that were uh, really funny, bizarre out there. Um, some some interesting stuff from the annals of uh, the, the kosher world. Is there anything uh, comes to mind? Avi, those things happen every day. Um, <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> okay, okay. You know what? I'll give you one story. Give me one. Give That's me, all I want. <laughs> I'll give you one story. This is an interesting one. We got an application from a um, from a company that made powdered milk for the prison system. Mm -hmm. So okay, fine. We we did exactly what we would normally do. We went. We audited. We got all their ingredients. Everything. Um, and then, you know, a couple months later, we, we certified again in our normal course. 
So then, you know, very soon after, I would say a month later, we get a, uh, it first comes in as a fax and then an email. It says, please um, give me the documentation with respect to your kosher certification of this company. Sincerely, prisoner ABCD. Oh, that's strange, but okay. So, you know, I tell, it, this actually email came in to, to the secretary in the office. I said, send him the kosher certificate. You know, he deserves to, to get the certificate. So she sends it to him. He replies, this is insufficient. I want all of the supporting documentation that goes into your granting this company certification. So, I mean, what other documentation do we have really, you know? So I tell her to, to reply, you know, this, this is really the only documentation we have on file for this company. Then he replies again, you are clearly fraudulently certifying this company. If you do not release all of the supporting documentation immediately, um, I will be, I will hereby initiate an action against you in civil court. I said, what is going on here? So I said, you know what, that's it. Um, I pick up the phone. I said, I'm calling the warden. So I call the warden of the facility. I said, warden, I got this weird thing going on where a prisoner is badgering us because he, he doesn't think our kosher certification is sufficient. I, I don't know what's going on. So he, first thing he says is, how is he emailing you? My prisoners don't have access to email. I said, yeah, I was wondering the same thing. I thought, you know, maybe it was one of those cushy prison facilities, but no. So he says, what's the name of the prisoner? So I tell him the name and he goes, oh no. I said, listen, I can't talk to you about this anymore, but all I'm going to suggest to you is Google this person's name and you'll find out whatever you need to find out. Okay, I hang up the phone with him. I Google the prisoner's name and I'm gonna say it here because it's important for the story. Uh, his name was Valeri Fabricant. Ooh, I, yeah. I Google it. Americans will mass, know who he is. But, yes, uh, I will yeah. explain. He is a mass murderer. He went and shot a, uh, up a, a university in, in Canada. Yeah. And in Montreal, right? And, and tragically killed a bunch of people. And, um, and I said, we're, we're dealing with mass murderers here. Um, and uh, anyway. Wow. Okay. So there you go. You never so, know. <laughs> Most of the clients that we have are fantastic, but sometimes you got a mass murderer. All right. Uh, I want to end on, uh, there's a positive question on a more positive note that uh, just came through here. Um, and I guess maybe it's an interesting thing uh, going into the larger world. You're we talking about the larger kosher world. Um, what is the relationship you have with the halal certifiers if there's any, I know that there are definitely a lot of products now that have multiple certifications, meaning kosher and halal and vegan and organic and all these things. Do you guys talk to each other or are you very much siloed in some way or another? Um, we talk, we, um, I have a, a, some good relationships with a few of the halal certifiers. And, um, you know, so it, it's, it's interesting to see that there is a lot of crossover. I would say that from our questions line, we get a number of questions, I would say almost on a daily basis um, from halal consumers, Muslim consumers who ask, you know, is this product suitable for my diet? And, you know, obviously we're not experts in halal, so we can't give them particular advice. We could just tell them that this product is free from animal, um, whatever. And so they, um, they usually take mm -hmm. that advice. Uh, but it's, it is a nice thing to see that a lot of the halal certifiers do rely on us. Um, and, but of course there are differences. One of the main nuance differences is that alcohol is not permitted um, for, for halal consumers. And so if they have, um, let's say flavors, which are a high component of the, of the product, then it could raise an issue. But for the most part, they do rely on, on kosher. And I've had some very nice exchanges with uh, halal um, you know, consumers and certifiers alike. At the same time, there's no real, um, I would, there's not cooperation in that we work together because the programs are different. Um, but, but occasionally, sometimes questions will come up and we'll be able to, to go back and forth. And it's nice to see that food is a, is a unifier, um, that of course there are other things out there that are challenging, but we all like to eat food and we can all sit down and, and have a, a really nice, uh, friendly and constructive conversation over food.
I, I can't think of a better way to, to wrap this up. Um, you know, like you said, food is, is really the great unifier. It's the thing that we do, you know, when we say that you want to get together, we break bread and we uh, sharing a meal is, is really such a beautiful thing. Um, you feed people. All right. And I want to thank you, first of all, for, for this past hour. I want to thank you for feeding people um, for the past, uh, you know, number of years um, at the COR, um, you're really enabling people um, to live uh, meaningful lives with, um, with the food that they eat. And, um, you know, and, you know, it's, uh, it's heartening to see that it's not just uh, the thing that the cliche, right, that you think of, which I'm sure you still get on a daily basis. Isn't it just the rabbi blessing the food? Right. And, and it's just so detailed and so involved. And, uh, and I want to thank you for, uh, for leading that charge in Canada. And, um, you know, that's about it. My pleasure. Well, it's really been fantastic and it's been so much fun. And thanks everyone for joining. I really appreciate it.